So after a heated session on politics and elections and politicians, we thought we should talk a little bit about individuals, professionals, professions, and life. I have with me one of the most outstanding individual Indian management thinkers. Rajat, Rajat Gupta is, is a well-known name and a face, both in India and worldwide. You know, George Bernard Shaw had once said, life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. I believe Rajat has, in many ways, created and recreated himself and also found himself. This is an individual with a tough childhood, brought up not by his parents, because he lost his parents young, went out and did them proud by demonstrating the best in education. A very successful education both at IIT and then at Harvard. Once he became a leader, he was, by the way, really the torch bearer of Indian professionals, first Indian to become the head of a, multi, a, a global multinational. So in many ways, uh, Rajat, you actually opened the door for many, many Indians who followed since then. You also did something interesting. Not many Indians who've gone out and built a career overseas or in global organizations have come back and done the kind of things you did for India. Your role in nation building here was quite unique. Setting up the Indian School of Business, which you know has become amongst the world's leading business schools. On the last, in a survey done only a few months ago, it was ranked as the fifth most desirable business school by applicants worldwide. It is also the only school to rank in the top 25 in the world. There are many, many accolades uh, to what ISB has done. ISB has done more research in its 17 or 18 years than all of the IMs put together in the 65 years. The second interesting initiative that you had uh, started was the Public Health Foundation of India. Again, an area which is sorely required by India to look at initiatives in public health. You did a lot of work with the ministers, prime ministers, state ministers, and chief ministers, advising them on a lot of the policy issue. I, I remember what was done in Andhra Pradesh in the old days, as also with Dr. Manmohan Singh and multiple initiatives that you had taken on, uh, including looking at the rural economy and agriculture in addition to the, the, the process of how governments are run. You also had, I would imagine in many ways, the only word I can use is a cathartic experience. You're running with the authorities, and then getting convicted and jailed, and then coming out and writing this book. I, I thought it was a wonderful title, by the way. Mind without fear. It would be helpful, uh, Rajat, if you walk us a little bit through what drives you. You've done these amazing things in your life. You had adversity, which is of the kind very few of us have seen. What drives you every morning when you get up? How are you able to to get on and do the next thing for yourselves? Well, first, and I'm going to uh, come back to some other questions later yeah, on. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, first, it's a privilege to be here uh, in front of all of you, and it's a privilege to be with Sunil, a uh, person I've worked with for a couple of decades now together. Uh, he's very modest by saying, talking about ISB, I can tell you that he is a co-founder of ISB and a moving force behind creating our Mohali campus, which has been extremely successful. 
Um, so your question is, uh, you know, what drives me? Um, <clears throat> I, I would have to say one thing that, you know, in my early days, I always very much concentrated on improving myself professionally. Um, when I joined McKinsey, which was the only employer I've ever worked with, I worked there 37 years, it was not about, in, in, in a way, McKinsey is a collaborative and competitive place all at the same time. And people keep a lot of scores, you know, when did you get elected partner, when did you do this, et cetera, et cetera. And in contrast, I had no experience before. I didn't know any better. I just thought I should try to become a better and better consultant. And so becoming a better professional was my passion rather than trying to figure out when I would make the next step in the ladder. And so one of the things that I've always felt is this sort of drive learning mindset, trying to become better at what you do. Another equally interesting force that drives me is that whenever I get very comfortable in, with something, I've learned that best is to change, to get out of your comfort zone to do something completely new challenge. You know, you get, I was in, the, I used to run the Scandinavian office for McKinsey. It was very successful. And uh, at the peak of the success, I decided I should leave Scandinavia because it was getting very easy and I was getting very comfortable. So after spending five, six years there, I decided that it was time to take on a new challenge. Similarly, in, in almost all of those things, I've always felt that you ought to get out of your comfort zone. The third thing that I always drove me was, I believe business is a force for good. Properly harnessed, it can really make a huge contribution, not only to business, but also to society. I also felt that business works at the permission of society, which means it must give back to the broader societal issues. And when I had the possibility or the capability and the platform, I started thinking about how to not only improve the performance of our clients, but how McKinsey could make a contribution to society in solving some of the most difficult problems of society. It's much easier to design a strategy for a company A, B, or C. It's much more difficult to figure out how to solve the healthcare crisis in a particular country or society. So another thing that drove me always was issues beyond just business and how do you make that contribution. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on what happened to you when this legal case came up? Your reputation was dragged through the streets, by the way. Sorry? Your reputation was dragged through the streets. Yeah. But we heard two different views. One which said this system has been unfair to you. You were pointed at because you were who you were, that you were an Indian who had become successful. And all that was going on was considered normal. The other one which said, in your position, you had reached the top, you should have known better. What was actually going on? What was the truth? So it's a very complex question. Let me try to give you an answer in some different dimensions. The first thing was the backdrop, you have to understand, is in 2008, the US went through the worst crisis in a generation. Lots of people lost their jobs, lots of people lost their pensions, their homes. There was a incredible sense of despair and the financial system was about to collapse. Now, what did the government do or what, what did we do? Basically, we rescued the financial system, which was necessary to do. 
but nobody really held accountable the real perpetrators of that financial crisis, which was the people who over leveraged, people who gave these loans without any basis for it, people who actually had you know, bad processes, fraudulent processes. Uh, they were trading on their own account. It was an, sort of a rampant set of practices, which today you would say uh, were really quite improper. Now, what, did the, what was the response? Basically, we fined these financial institutions, which the shareholders paid most of the fines, and we didn't hold any of the management accountable. In this mode, the public was in a state saying, we need to find who is responsible for this and get somebody. So the prosecution went after hedge funds. Hedge funds didn't cause the financial crisis. They could not hold anybody who actually was responsible accountable. In that context, um, Raj Ratnam was, was uh, singled out fairly. Even in hedge fund managers, they couldn't get people like Stevie Cohn, who was clearly got away with just paying fines. Now, in all of that, let me start by simply stating, and those of you, and I wish you would uh, have an opportunity to read my book, um, I didn't, I'm not an insider trader. I didn't do any insider trading. In insider trading, there are three things you have to satisfy. One is that you actually passed on inside information. Second, that you actually had a quid pro quo and had benefit. And third, that you had criminal intent. The, there was no proof presented of any of those three elements. There was some circumstantial evidence. You could weave a story, and the prosecutors did a very good job in weaving a story. Um, but it wasn't a true story. And you are basically judged by a jury which really doesn't understand the ins and outs of financial But you situations. chose not to testify in your own defense. Yeah. Do you now regret that? Yes, I do, and I say that in the book that I really regret that. I'm not sure that even if I had testified, the outcome would be different. I'm not sure. But I would say that I was, my lawyers didn't do such a good job. They constantly advised me not to testify. I insisted I was going to testify. We, in fact, told the judge I was going to testify. And in the last weekend before I was to testify, the lawyers kept pushing me, saying, you know, I think that's a mistake. You shouldn't testify. And I must say, and I say that in the book, um, is that I probably succumbed to I was beaten down by that time, three weeks of trial and the government sort of telling stories and stories and lots of untruths. I was quite beaten down about how the trial was going and how the justice system was. And uh, I succumbed to, I, poor, I can poor, only say fear. Poor advice. Yeah, poor advice and also, you know, I was frozen and I just, sort of gave up, in a way. And um, I titled the book Mind Without Fear for many reasons. One of them is that, of course, it's an aspiration that we all should have, and I have it. But at that moment, I think I succumbed to fear. <clears throat> so I want to go to another dimension of your life. You have been amongst the most successful professionals the world has seen in a while. There are lots of entrepreneurs, professionals, managers in this room. Give us two or three tips you think are useful, because there are lots of young people here as well. Give us a few tips you think which are useful as people build their careers, must do and must not do. Well, firstly, different people have different styles of leadership and how they manage their own 
professional development. But I would say that I already mentioned one or two, uh, you know, really focusing on professional development, not staying too long in your comfort zone, those types of things actually lead to your professional and career development. Another thing I would, I have found myself was that it is far more effective if you work in a team and if you make other people successful. No matter how brilliant you are, how good you are, if you think I am going to be the person who is going to, through my skills and my brilliance, going to be extremely successful in creating institutions, making a long-term impact on institutions or society, you're wrong. You have to build a team. You have to build other people successful. And they, in turn, will make you far more successful than ever you ever dreamt of. So I think that's a, that's a management philosophy that I think you should. Uh, the other thing comes back to sort of the classic which is our tradition of a karma yogi. Just focus on doing the right thing. Doing the right thing with the right intentions, with the best that you can offer. Do the best you can, and don't worry about the results. The outcomes, the, the unattachment to outcomes frees you to do a lot of things. And you don't worry about whether it's successful or not, because in the, in the end, over a long period of time, basically, the results will follow. It may not follow right then, but you have to detach yourself from the results and attach yourself to the effort. It's sort of action with detachment, I would say, is a very good philosophy. So are you resigned, angry, upset about this period in your life? Has writing the book helped you? Does it bring more peace? Does it raise uncomfortable memories? So how, how does this, this phase appear to you now? So firstly, I would say that I'm not, I'm not angry. I, I, I don't think anger helps anybody. I mean, what does it do if you're angry? It only hurts you. So I think my, my father used to always say, you know, you can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you react. So it is very important to react with grace, with humility, with lack of anger. You know, he spent 10 years in and out of jails in the freedom struggle. I never heard him speak one bad word about the British or about his jailers or anybody. Anger is not an emotion that is helpful. Um, my greatest regret of this time period is actually that I had already started spending more than half my time on philanthropic things. There was actually an initiative I started here which I had to stop in the middle, which was to create an institute for urban development because I thought one of the biggest issues in the country is uncontrolled, unplanned urbanization, which is going to really come and haunt us. There was more urban poor than than urban middle class in most of our large cities. So, you know, it's a, it's a journey that was interrupted, and I have great regrets that uh, that happened. But I would also say that I wouldn't be the person I am today without the experience I went through. As they say, in adversity, you learn a lot. And if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. So I feel that this period has been, yeah, good for me. So what are your plans now? What are you doing nowadays? Well, I have... Other than, of course, the, the book and the book tour, because... Yeah, the book, yeah. The book was, um, you know, not easy to write. Uh, this is the first book I'm, I've written, so there's a challenge in writing books, and I don't know how many of you have written books. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, but also it was a particularly difficult topic because you 
both write about your life and you write about the difficult times. So it took me some time to do it. Um, I also, after I came out of prison, I spent a lot of time with my family and renewing friendships and so on. But I've started getting involved also back into uh, the passions I had, which is basically education and health. I think those are two areas which are the great equalizers in, in society. Uh, without education and health, you cannot have human beings realize their full potential. So it is very important, it's a, it's a human right to have access to education and access to healthcare. And that's what I really fundamentally believe in and work on. So I've, I've started re-engaging with you know, institutions like ISB and PHFI, which I founded, but I also have started working on some public health initiatives. In fact, I was in Ahmedabad last year. We started a major initiative on maternal and child health. Uh, and we have now created a, it's a population of 300,000 where we have mapped their health status and are trying different interventions to see what really works. A 300,000 population, it will be the longest, I mean, it will be the largest longitudinal trial of this kind, which is a planned to be a five-year um, experiment on what interventions work. So back to healthcare and, and um, one other passion that I've developed is through this time period, I've seen the underbelly of the US justice system. US has the largest population of incarcerated people, which is over two and a half million or something like that. There are 100, over 100 million people in the US out of a population of 300 plus which have been affected by somebody incarcerated in their family and so on. So it's a huge issue. Uh, it needs major reform and I hope to make my small contribution to that. By the way, the book is available just outside for those of you who are interested. And I don't know if Rajat will have the time to sign if, in, in those books if, if, uh, if some people are interested. Unfortunately, probably not because I have to run to another event after this. All right, all right. So the, the big wave that's coming at us right now, like a wall, is technology. Innovation is something that has driven human enterprise right through history for millennia. And we always used to say the only constant in life is change. The worrying thing now for people is the pace of change itself has changed. It's changed so much that sometimes it becomes hard to keep up. And this big debate about whether technology will be the driver, uh, will drive human behavior, or people will still be able to stay on top and use technology as a tool. What is your view on this, and what is your advice on how should people approach technology? I, I would, you know, I would say that not only is that question, but the pace of change is such, and the technological advances are so profound in every field, where you have seen the life expectancy double in, in a century in the world, and it's still going up, and more innovation is to come. So life sciences extraordinary innovation pace, communications, electronics, all that. So productivity is also dramatically increased over the years in every field, in agriculture, in industrial work, etc. So all that means is that it takes actually less and less input to produce the same output. It has profound implications on the workforce. It has profound implications of the role of work in life because so far since the agrarian economy when you basically worked from sunrise to sundown and then you worked eight hour shifts in the industrial world and you know in the service sector, etc. It's not clear to me that you need to work 40 hours a week to uh, produce everything that needs to be done. 
which means that there's going to be an enormous amount of time available and you have to change the concept of work and culture and arts and social cohesion and different interests are going to dominate. All that is going to be great unless we don't really take care of climate change and make sure the earth still survives. I mean, there is a big risk that we'll make ourselves extinct. If you, have, if you haven't read the book, you should read the book called The Sixth Extinction, mm. which is an interesting book which says that we are in the period of, there, were, there have been five extinctions before. The last one was the dinosaur when the me meteorite hit. We are going through the sixth, which means we are killing so many species yeah. today in the world that it's not clear we will survive unless we do some proactive things. Before I open uh, to the house for questions, I have just one more. I'm going back to, to what you said about prison. Now, it will be interesting and useful for us to hear. What did you do there? I believe you set up something called a breakfast club in there with some of the other inmates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you were also in solitary for a while. So is, are the two experiences quite different? And what did you learn from the inmates who had been there much longer than you? Is that what is driving you to focus on, on the justice system? So let me start by saying those of you who have either read the book or will read the book might come away with the impression that prison is a cakewalk. Well, it really wasn't. It's a very tough experience to go through. But when I was entering prison, I always sort of thought, what am I going to do? First, I went into a low security prison, which means that basically, you know, there are not even any fences. You, you, there are boundaries, but no fences, and it's a pretty, um, it, it's a Spartan place. You have bunk beds and your area is a little and all that, but you have a fair amount of freedom inside the prison to do whatever you wish. And I thought I was, I would enter prison like really a monastery. I thought, you know, this is a time to kind of go and reflect and learn. So I read a lot, I wrote a lot. I also interacted with people I would never come in touch with otherwise in my life. And from that experience came a lot of humility. These people you know, basically most of them were for drug crimes or other things like that. But the justice system was such, they had draconian sentences, and many of them really should never have been there. They were petty, petty crimes, and, uh, and, but they were very in, at, inherently quite good people. You know, I documented their cases. I interviewed 40 of them in detail. And found out you know, what had happened to them through the justice system. So that was the first part of my uh, prison experience. There were fun parts in it. I started a breakfast club, a bridge club, a book club, you know, all of that. It was interesting to you know, lead as sort of a, you have time on your hands, so basically you engage in many fun activities. But then, uh, for no reason at all, actually, very flimsy reasons, I was put in solitary confinement. And um, solitary confinement is like basically involuntary vipassana. Um, but the conditions were extremely harsh. I mean, uh, to describe to you the, the cell that you're put in is maybe uh, just where you and I are sitting a little bit round here, every piece of object is made out of steel. So the bed is a steel bunk. The um, toilet is a steel toilet with no uh, seats or anything. The wash basin is steel. There is a door, a steel door with a little window where they pass the meal to you, like you know, you're being fed as a zoo animal kind of thing. And uh, it's very, very harsh conditions. So one thing I had an opportunity to do, I 
had two books with me, and I convinced them these are my religious books. You have to let let me take them. It's like my Bible. So one was um, the Bhagavad Gita, which I had never read cover to cover. I had read pieces of it, but never cover to cover. And I read many times over there. The other, other one, I was trying to learn or self-learn meditation. So I had a book on you know, Pranayam by Iyengar, which I thought was a wonderful book. So I had these two, and I, that saved me a lot in solitary confinement. But to give you an idea, one would think that solitary confinement would be very quiet. You know, nobody to talk to. You're there in your cell by yourself. But it was the noisiest place in prison because people were there going absolutely crazy. UN defines solitary confinement beyond a week as torture. And people were going crazy. They would bang on doors. They would keep shouting. They would, you know, it was the noisiest place like a railway station or worse. And banging on the doors and clanking and so on. So it was, a, it was quite an experience in terms of being there for seven weeks. I would say that um, in the US system, they willy-nilly, with the flimsiest of excuses, put you in solitary confinement because they're misaligned incentives. The prison gets paid more if you're in solitary confinement per prisoner than if you're in the normal facility. So basically the incentive of the prison administration is to keep the solitary confinement wing full.